Dr. Menas Kafatas. With great respect and love, I welcome you from my heart. God lives within you as you. This is how my master used to address us all. With great respect and love, I welcome you with all my heart. That is welcoming everyone into the space of the heart. And then right after that, he would say, God lives within you as you. It took me 20 years to figure out what he meant. God is not someone out there. It is you. And it is me. In fact, in this new, what I call, Amazing Hypothesis, just to give it a name, which is the rediscovery of true science. All there is is God. So we either take it seriously or we say, oh, it's another, another teaching. It's not a teaching, it's reality. Now, the issue is, is that reality taking place all the time. And I submit to you that quantum physics has opened the door to the science of consciousness that was always there. I only have two slides, so, and you don't even need to pay attention to them, but there are just pointers as we go down. The interaction, the experience. Because really, this is an experience of you, an experience of me. And truly speaking, there's no difference between us. I play the role of the lecturer, and then you play the role of the audience. But of course, I have been playing the other role, sitting down and watching the other speakers, or listening to the other speakers. And that role is the exchanging the relationship between the subjective experience of watching and the objective experience of listening. However, from your point of view, you are the subject and I'm the object. So this is a great mystery. Let me just run, get right to the point. The amazing hypothesis that I suggest to you tonight is what you already know. It's no news, really. But it is good news. Uncompromising view of the fundamental nature of consciousness. Why do I call it uncompromising? Because it is either true 100% or it's not true. It can be, well, sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. Well, that is our experience, right? Sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. But that's really is the role of the mind. The mind creates and splits. It is the role of the mind. As I mentioned before, the mind can make us appreciate a flower or a plant. And the mind can also drive us to the worst realms of hell for some unknown reason. He would also say, my teacher many years ago, he would say, and he would laugh, he was actually a lot of fun. He would say, it's like a horse. You're sitting on the horse, and Sheikh Nasruddin, who is a colorful character from the East, he would get on the horse, and he didn't know how to ride a horse. So he says, I'm a good equestrian. I'm going to ride a horse. He got on the horse, and the horse knew immediately that this guy doesn't know how to ride a horse. So he started running like crazy. 
So he was holding for his dear life to the horse, the horse being the mine. And the horse was just going all over the place trying to kick him up. And so somebody f finally took pity on Sheikh Nasruddin and said, uh, Sheikh Nasruddin, where are you going? And he said, I don't know, ask the horse. <laughs> it's funny, but ask the horse. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going, ask the horse. So we don't know where we're going because of our minds. However, if we are true equestrians, and I've done it, by the way, a couple of times, it is actually tough to ride a horse, and the horse, as soon as you, see, as soon as you get on top of it, it knows whether you know or not. And usually, you know, for tourists like me, uh, where they visit these barns, the horses take pity on us. They say, okay, this guy is a guy. Okay. Usually they, they take tame horses, because if they put you on a real horse, <laughs> it's going to be like chicken Nasser. You're running and say, I don't know where the heck I'm going. So the amazing hypothesis is, and I compromise in view. Why do I say I compromise? Well, really because um, it is either our experience, and it has to be everyday experience, but then if you don't have that experience, if I don't have that experience, we shouldn't beat ourselves up and say, oh, I don't have that experience. I'm in duality. Oh, poor me. When am I going to ever get liberated? Get rid of that idea of liberation. It's another horse we're riding. Truly speaking. It is simple and at the same time all encompassing. That's why it's amazing. It's very simple. So let's experiment a little bit with that. What do we mean by all encompassing consciousness. I'm going to go around, if you don't mind, I will interact with you and ask you. And you don't have to say anything. This is a free country, right? So let's take that definition as seen up there the I-ness, the I awareness. What is the I awareness for you? Your name is Tara. 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 Um, I don't know. Sorry. That's, that's a good answer. Yeah. Because I consciousness has everything in it, including I don't know. Your name is Layla. Layla. You can be shy, it's okay. <laughs> I don't know either, really. Okay. My friend over there knows. <laughs> I'm trying to spice it up a little bit. Okay. What, what is eye consciousness for you? Um, experience. Yeah. The man's got it. Experience. Ronald, experience, right? Right. Experience. Not so sure about the experience alone. Not sure about experience. Is there anything else besides experience? Emotion. Emotion. What is emotion? When you say I have an emotion, like I'm very happy, what is that? You experience. Oh, it's it, right? an experience. Yeah. So really, truly speaking, the I consciousness we are talking about is experience. Mm. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the only thing that there is, experience. But that experience also has, I don't know. And it's perfectly OK to not know, because that's part of experience. I am talking about the awareness of existence from which all experience springs out, which itself is pure experience. We were born with that from the very beginning, and it's going to be with us until we drop this physical body. 
I also suspect very strongly that that's not the end of life, that life goes on. But we won't get into that tonight. So it is the pure I awareness, not the ego. You might say, oh, wait a second. Now you're confusing us. The ego is the one that says, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I don't know, I know, this guy is boring, I got to get out of there and get some wine. And those, all these things are experiences. But what is the constant background is what they call in the East the perfect eye awareness. And they have a term, Purno Aham Vimarsha. Purno Aham Vimarsha. It's a Sanskrit term, and it is from Kashmir Chavis, the other great monistic school besides Vedanta. Purno Aham, Aham means I am. Purno is perfect, Aham is I am. Vimarsha is the active awareness. So the active awareness of knowing who I am. And that is eye consciousness. They also give it the three terms, being, awareness, and bliss. Or sat, chit, ananda. Sat is being. Awareness is chit, or chiti. And usually, she is a female, the female goddess. And ananda is the bliss or love. Now, in science, we don't talk about ananda. We really are ashamed of it, I guess. Physicists don't talk about love. But it is the driving force of the universe. It's Ananda that drives the whole thing. The Christians of ancient times, they knew about it and they called it the Holy Spirit. So they actually were talking a little bit about the Trinity. But in this Trinity, there's no separation between being, awareness of being, and Ananda. Everything that we do in life, is for the purpose, whatever that means, of the sheer enjoyment of existence. Even if we have addictions, right? Addictions are for the pure bliss of it. I just had a glass of wine before I came in. It's, it was good. It's good. Good wine. You may say, well, wait, wait a second. Well, come on, now you're ju going to justify all the big crimes of humanity? No, of course not. This is where the mind enters the picture and divides. But pure being has this triadic existence. And that's why in Shaivism they call it the triadic system. And you actually you find the triad or the trinity in everything. Being, can you deny you exist? I mean, the question is it's so silly. Why are we even talking about it? Being. Now, Parmenides, who we heard this morning, went right to the point. He said, being. I don't know what this non-being is. Everything is being. Even the quantum vacuum is being. By the way, the quantum vacuum is not empty. It's full of virtual particles. So I always describe it as the quantum vacuum to distinguish from the vacuum which is usually in the heads of some people. Some people have a great vacuum in their heads. <laughs> Empty-headed, we call them. But the quantum vacuum is really filled up with virtual particles. Universal consciousness operates at every level of reality. It is found in fundamental anus. This is what the only true God, as far as I'm concerned, I may be wrong, but the only true God that exists, and that is the observer, witness of everything that is going on in the universe. It's as simple as that. It's so simple that that's why I call it the uncompromising perception, which is mysterious and at the same time amazing. Because once you wake up to it, you say, oh my God, Oh my God, you say. <laughs> well, we say, oh my God. <laughs> Is that simple? Yes, it's that simple. And you say, what? <sighs> I know, this Cafados guy, he's trying to sneak something on us now. I'm not trying to sneak anything. I'm just having fun here. 
the Ananda part that's speaking now. <laughs> okay, it's the Ananda part. It is the one reality that we cannot get rid of. Can you get rid of your own existence and your own awareness of your own existence? I know, sometimes I look in my mirror and I don't have any hair anymore. I hear my voice, my voice is more or less the same as it used to be. But when I look at the mirror, I say, who is this guy? And then I look at some of the old pictures I had, little kid. I start laughing. How did this become this? And of course you know that in seven years, every single cell of our body changes. So what keeps the cells of our body having that awareness year after year for how many years, however many years we live on this planet Earth? It's existence and consciousness and bliss. If it didn't exist that way, there would be no body. There would be the non-being that Parmenides said, forget it, it does, doesn't even make any sense. Okay, so you say, all right. I didn't say anything, by the way, about infinite, infinity here. Did I say anything about infinity? I didn't say anything about infinity. And I'm not really going to talk about infinity because infinity is very, very well defined in mathematics and it is actually a beautiful concept, but it usually conjures ideas in the minds of people that are not real. Who has experienced infinity? You can experience if you start down real numbers and you get immersed in mathematics. But that's not really, if, yeah, if you're a mathematician, it's great. So I'm not going to talk about infinity. It is very real, and right here, right now. It's uncompromising from that point of view. You may say, well, if that is so simple, how come this unbounded, I didn't say infinity, I said unbounded, right? Non-local. Entangled reality, I'm throwing some quantum terms at you, takes on this appearance of a finite physical body and a mind that usually drives us into trouble, <laughs> except when we learn how to ride a horse and then the horse gets us there. How does it do it? Through adopting various Limiting principles. We call these limiting principles, it's not a term to belittle a regular existing reality. Regular existing reality is all the reality there is. It's not out there. In fact, there's no out there, except in our minds. And then sometimes you say, are you out of your mind? Actually, we should be out of our minds. It would be wonderful if we were out of our minds. Or at least sometimes to leave the mind behind. It adopts three basic principles. And I won't tell you that these are the only ones that exist, but they are quite useful for us. They come out from physics and, I believe, biology, and here they are, complementarity, recursion, and meaning. And we're going to go around and I ask you to tell me a little bit about each one of those, because you experience them all the time. Complementarity, it's not opposites. It's not either or, it is either and or the opposite. Either and or. The and is very important. It's not either or, it's either and or. Complementarity is the wave particle duality. Duality is not a good term because it says it's this and that. It's both. But not at the same time. In fact, there's no time here. I didn't even say anything about time. Time is a construct that we the human mind creates, the ego, and you may say, well, if it's so, if it's all in our mind, how come you are getting older? Because the mind is all that's driving the universe. It's a mindful universe. The universe is the coalescence of consciousness into minds. And some of these minds become human minds, and then we have human experience. 
Complementarity is a very deep principle. It is the foundation of the Copenhagen interpretation. And I know that there are various schools of thought that say that maybe complementarity or the Copenhagen interpretation is right, not right. And I would say that it's also partially true. Um, it's not the total truth, let's put it that way. So complementarity is perhaps what Bohr struggled very much with it. And he said the language itself sort of limits us. It is the positive and the negative. It is the up and the down. It is the evolution and the involution. It is the male and female. It is the yin and the yang. It's the horrible and not horrible. And the love and not love. Oh, by the way, there's no such thing as non, not love. Everything is love. But maybe the experience of not love. Complementarity. It drives the universe. In fact, it is the creative force of the universe. So the creative force of the universe is paradoxical. If we are to understand our own existence, we have to accept that it is paradoxical. We are the embodiment of paradox, folks. Let's wake up to that reality. It's not that we're crazy. Yeah, we're crazy and also very rational beings. We're paradoxical. And if you reject the paradoxical, this is what the ancients were trying to do with the gods and the goddesses. And the ancient Greek pantheon had crazy gods and goddesses. Some of them were really out of their minds, like my favorite god, Bacchus, would always drink and also play music. And at some point, the female minor goddesses tore him apart. I don't know why, but they did. <laughs> OK? So it's paradoxical. Creation is paradoxical. The second one is recursion. Recursion means that whatever you see at one level must occur at every level. As above, so below. As here, so elsewhere are some of the writings. Conventions. However, in quantum theory, it takes on a specific form. One form of the recursive relationship is the patterns that you see in flowers, the spirals. They repeat themselves. Catherine Pepin told us today about she showed us some of those wonderful patterns, right? The pattern between um, particles and waves. The spirals, the nonlinear aspects. There are people who say that quantum effects don't manifest at the macroscopic level. BS, you know what BS means. When I hold this plant, it's because of the Pauli exclusion principle. Think about it. There will be no molecular bonds without the Pauli exclusion principle. If the universe was truly classical, the only objects that we could have would be spheres. Gravity tends to form spheres. But even stars would not exist, because you know what keeps stars together? It's nuclear for reactions at the center of the star, which are quantum effects. But let's say that some magical thing the force of gravity could be balanced by some maybe electromagnetic forces, right? In the case of stars. They would be spheres. Classical physics cannot explain this rose or these flowers. So it's not true that quantum theory does not manifest at the everyday world. It manifests at every level. In fact, it's quantum theory all the way to the bottom and all the way to the top. When people say that quantum effects do not manifest, they mean the strange quantum effects. But they are all strange. They are all strange. The power exclusion principle says that you cannot put two electrons in the same quantum states, all of them being identical, because they repulse themselves. And when, in fact, you try to put them together, you have stars that are called white dwarfs, where the sun collapses down to the size of 
the earth. And if you go beyond the white dwarf and you squeeze things even more, you get the neutron star, which is about 10 kilometers in size, but has the size of the sun. And a cubic centimeter, the tip of your finger, will weigh like 100 battleships together. That's nuclear matter. So the power explosion principle is very real. And it's actually manifests in collapsed stars. The third principle is meaning. That's the tough one. Leibniz rediscovered, but actually he was, again, an Aximander, Parmenides, another, and I think also um, Archimedes. I said Archimedes, didn't I? Yeah, Archimedes, Anaximander. Pythagoras didn't quite have it yet, but they, all these ancient philosophers, they talked about meaning, and Leibniz, of course, rediscovered. Something must be meaningful in the universe. This is our gut feeling. So when these atheistics, atheistic scientists, I won't name any names tonight, I'll, I'll be nice. <laughs> we talked about them before. When they say it's all random process, how can two electrons out of 10 to the 80 power, there's 10 to the 80 electrons in the universe, how can two of them be the same? Because of recursion, the same properties apply at every level. And in fact, that's why science is possible. Scientists believe in the existence of principles. But when they do that, they're really talking about something maintaining, sustaining the universe. Recursion is sustenance. The third one is the one that gives us some grace, because it says it all makes meaning. It all has meaning. What is your meaning? What is the meaning of your life? If I may be so bold to ask. Tell us the first thing that pops in your head. Meaning. She closes her eyes. That's a true meaning. It is meaning. Yes. What is the meaning of your life? To enjoy. Enjoy. I know what you're going to say. Enjoy. See the relations of stars, right? <laughs> Since seeing the relationships of stars, he gave a great talk today about stars and families. And understanding that matter and that energy. Yeah, understand matter and that energy, yeah. So meaning really is what we put to it, and the meaning for each one of us is different. Remember, God lives within you as you. As you, not as somebody else. God lives within you as you. So each one of us has a different experience. Vive la différence, as the French say, right? At the same time, we are all following certain relationships that are occurring at every level because that's how unbound, unmanifest, I awareness becomes the universe. In fact, the universe is nothing else than unbound manifest consciousness. There's no difference between mind and body. It's mind-body. My mind and my body. So who says my mind and my body? The mind. The tricky mind. But the experience is really mind-body. So you should revise new terms, such as mind-body, the same way that Einstein devised a new term, which is actually correct, space-time. It's not space and it's not time, it's space-time. And you get the great theory of relativity, special in general, because of that. Now, qualia. Qualia is the emerging new Science is not really new, it's very old, very ancient. It's a science of experience. It's what in the East 
schools and in the Western schools. It's not just Eastern schools. It's also the Western schools we're teaching about. Qualia is the qualitative aspect. The red of a rose or the pink of a rose or the yellow of this flower. There's nothing in quantum physics or in biology that will have the yellow color be created in the brain. In fact, the brain does not create anything. The, the, brain, the brain assembles the mind into specific experience. Now, this actually connects to the ancient monistic wisdom systems. And I don't know if you can see this, but I'll read it to you in Sanskrit. Why? Because the words themselves have power. Chidhi Svatantra Vishva Siddhi Hedudu is the first first sutra of the Pratyabhijna Hridayam. Chidhi Svatantra Vishva Siddhi Hedudu. Chiti is universal consciousness, female creative force of the universe. Svatantra is a great word. It means absolute freedom. She's totally, absolutely free. Not relatively free. Absolutely free. Vishva Siddhi Hedudu. The universe, Siddhi, means the powers of the universe. The manifestation of the universe, Hetu, creates. How does she create? The second sutra, the prayer to be a Janina Hridayam. She projects on her own screen. I think Rupert talked to us about that. Projects onto her own screen the object subject complementarity. She appears an object to subject, but it's really her own body of conscious awareness that is doing it. And there's 18 more sutras, but we won't go through them. So Chidi is Vatantra, Visva Siddhi Hedidu. In fact, the fourth sutra talks about the mind, and this is the good news. They say the mind is nothing more than a condensed form of consciousness. Aha. So the mind is nothing more than the blissful, the blissful, brightening consciousness manifesting as individual existence. She does not lose her universal properties. Those properties, by the way, are everywhere. If you truly ask yourself the paradoxical in your life, you will see it. I've seen it all the time. I say, oh my God. Eh. Like the paradox, the paradox I mentioned before about the, I was driving the car backwards. It was actually a great dream. It was like a spaceship. I was driving the car backwards. It was a TT and it was not a TT. I was driving this way and the front of the car was that way. And the car was very long. I said, I I'm driving it backwards. <laughs> and I started saying, oh, this is a lot of fun. So space and time, direction, up and down. The next slide, and I'm going to wrap up with that, is, I guess I do that, right? <laughs> is how does she do it? And remember, it's not she, it's a he and it's it. Undivided consciousness, which is really the I-ness, splits into objects and subjects. How? Through assuming limitations. In physics, we call it symmetry breaking. And I really believe that quantum field theory, quantum physics, is accessible to everybody. If it's not accessible to everybody, we physicists are not doing a good job. It's not that you are not understanding it. And certainly, we don't have to dumb it down, as quite often we paternalistically say, OK, I'm going to dumb it down so you can understand it. No. These three principles, you can see them in every day of your life. Complementarity, paradox, right? Yes, no, up and down. Something that maintains order, everything. If we didn't have order, it would go crazy. There would be no universe. And finally, what drives the whole thing is conscious awareness. Through a some limitation of its infinite, this is the first time I mentioned the word infinite, infinite free will. If you like, by, bless you. If you like, by assuming limitations that are still the same chitti. She has not gone away. She's still there. She is each one of us. 
She did his Vatantra, Visva Siddhi Hedutu. Out of her infinite free will, she takes on boundaries. In fact, the example they gave is puts on codes, hides herself. Symmetry breaking. We say, call it in quantum field theory. Universal complementarity, recursion meaning. Out of this spring new mathematics. What I'm, I'm saying has to come down to some fundamental mathematics. The mathematics I'm talking about, and I'm working on a couple of other people, is mathematics that is very profound, so profound that it's so, so, so simple. In that mathematics, the zero and the one are the same. There's no zero and there's no one. Zero and one are the same. The experience, I am that, all there is is I am. The that and the I are one and the other. Zero and one, it's infinitely recursive. Zero is equal to one, is equal to two. Actually, there's no two and three. There's only one and one and one and one and one. And when you add them together, it's still one. So this is the new mathematics I'm referring to. And it comes out, by the way, from Hilbert space mathematics in quantum theory. It's actually quite simple. Out of this fundamental mathematics, we still don't have regular mathematics, space-time, sub-Planck level, spring out, and eventually space-time, manifesting as qualia. Qualia are the sense of red, the sense of bitter, the sense of sweet, and by the way, the sense of mathematics. In fact, qualia is the way that experience manifests itself. Is there anything else besides qualia? I submit to you, no. There's nothing else besides qualia. And philosophers of science have turned it into the hard problem. It's not a hard problem. It's a very easy problem. There is a primal subjectivity, and there's a primal nature. I'm not talking about the ego. The ego, by the way, comes way down, way down here. First, the intellect. The ego and the mind. But mind is nothing more than the same thing up there. In fact, the whole thing here is not going down. It's also going up. It's an infinite recursive sets of loops, all steeped in the experience of I am. And that is your true nature. I am. Aham. What, in fact, Moses, so amazing that ancient religions, they all had the same experience. What Moses was given on the mountain, I am that I am. What was Moses talking about? That's exactly what Moses was talking about. I am that I am. And in fact, you can say, I am that I am. I am that I am. Recursive relationships. He came down and told them, and then nobody understood what he meant. But that's what he meant. And also the same, the same aham pretty simple. You can find it in the ancient monistic systems. And the most amazing thing is actually it is the sound of your own breath. Your own breath, so many thousands of times every day gives the sound aham, I am, I am, I am, I am. Then we say, I am that. But as long as you are into the I am experience, the that is part of yourself. Consciousness projects. The appearance, it's not illusion, it's the appearance, it's a mirror, it's a mirror. Appearance of an object onto herself. Where does the split occur? The split occurs when you say, I am not that. Bingo. That's what the mind does. I am not that. I'm not that. I'm a liberal guy. I'm not fascist. Split. I am rich. I'm not poor, or whatever. Split, split, split. And then we forget that it's all 
a recursive game to eventually come down to the physical universe. Now, in physics, they're trying to, we're trying to create everything from bottom up. By the way, this could, you could reverse this diagram and put it at the top, it doesn't matter. You could put it right to left, it doesn't really matter. You could reverse the whole thing. But I submit to you that it's tough to build the Cathedral of Notre Dame by studying every single stone and every single stained glass in the great cathedral. Have you been to the Cathedral of Notre Dame? It's a magnificent structure. Or the Great Pyramids. Or the ancient temple in Jerusalem. Or the Parthenon. All these great structures. It's hard to build them by just studying the stones and the steel and the glass. What is missing? The blueprint. Somebody had the idea of the Notre Dame. So where do the ideas come from? Chidi is Vatantra, Visva, Siddhi, Hedidu. That's where they come from. You say, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's fine. That's also part of Chidi. She plays games of hiding herself from ourselves. But let's have fun with it. So if one thing we can take away tonight is the bliss part, the Ananda part, the L word that scientists don't want to talk about, the love part, L word. That's why I'm going to go back to art, because there you speak openly about love. They don't have to hide it. You know, in physics, when they discover the quantum of love, then it's going to be a major revolution. Actually, it's already there. But <laughs> <laughs> because all quanta, all quanta we have shown have sentience. They are all loving. Electrons won't come together. My last part in question. Is the electron inside a 10 million degree core of the sun the same as the electron in your brain? Or is it different? What distinguishes one from the other? Is it same or different? It's the same. same. At the same time, it's different. Complementary. It's the same because if it was not the same, there would be no way for the electrons to communicate together. But it's not that the electrons in the brain somehow are magically, ooh, ooh you know, they have power of life. The electrons in the center of the sun have the power of life. In fact, we call with Neil Tice, just published a paper, got accepted. I was very surprised it got accepted because it was really radical, so to speak, we said sentience at every level. We said sentience exists even at the level, even, of course, at the level of superstrings. They are sentient. Everything is sentient. So when we say consciousness, we don't mean human consciousness. And this is where the big arguments come about. Say, oh, but you know, how can you say that we're human awareness? No. Universal awareness which manifests as human beings. Thank you.